Okay, so today's video is going to be a hopefully a relatively brief um, chemistry review, as well as a um, little talk about water, which hopefully a lot of that will be review. I know that a lot of you guys are currently in chemistry, so anything that is not review, you may need to come in for some extra tutoring to be sure you're caught up with us. And because, like I said, we're going to try to go through these relatively quickly. So the first thing that we need to talk about is the difference between an element um, versus a compound. Okay, so an element is going to be um, uh, something that cannot be broken down any further than it already is. Okay, so elements cannot be broken down by chemical reactions. I've got 92 chemically occurring, uh, naturally occurring elements. Okay, all of these on the periodic table. These are all elements. Okay, um, a compound is going to be two or more different elements combined in a fixed ratio. For example, here I've got water. Okay, I've got two or more elements. I've got hydrogen, I've got oxygen. They are combined in a fixed ratio of two hydrogens to one oxygen. The properties of these elements are going to be, uh, the properties of this compound will be different than the properties of the element, the way they are combined together. Okay, uh, let's take a look at a, another compound. Uh, let's talk about table salt. Okay, so table salt, which is a mixture of sodium chloride, okay, it comes from a mixture of um, sodium which is a soft metal. It'll explode when it comes into contact with water, okay, as well as a uh, mixture with, mixed with chlorine, okay, which is a poisonous gas. That's what we have here. Okay, so I've got my sodium okay, here, the soft metal that explodes in water. Chlorine, poisonous gas. Okay, when those two come together, they make table salt that we eat and we don't think twice about it. Right, because the chemical properties of that compound are very difficult, different than the chemical properties of the individual elements. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about the elements that we find in the human body. Okay, so the most common elements are listed here. We've got um, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, calcium, phosphorus, potassium. You guys can read. Okay, uh, one of the ways that you guys can, uh, one of the ways that hopefully will help you remember this, okay, is what is called C. Hopkins. Oh, that needs to be capitalized. Cafe. Okay, and C. Hopkins Cafe, the H should be capitalized, okay, is our most common elements that we find in living things. Okay, so we've got carbon, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, phosphorus, potassium, iodine, nitrogen, sulfur, calcium, and iron. So C. Hopkins Cafe. So those are our most common elements in, found in living things. Okay, so y'all should know what an atom is. Okay, so an atom would be our smallest unit of matter, still retains its properties. Okay, and so with an atom, you know, we've got our subatomic particles that'll make up our atom. Okay, and so remember we've got protons, neutrons, um, electrons as well. So we've got protons and neutrons. You're going to find those inside of the nucleus of the atom. Okay. Um, and then our electrons we would find on the outside floating in the electron cloud. Okay. So I've got protons and neutrons here in the nucleus of the atom. Okay. And then I'm going to have my electrons on the outside. And the electrons are really what are going to give the atom its chemical properties. Okay, these electrons that we find floating in the electron cloud. Okay, um, a few here. Uh. Okay, so let's uh, do a, some more definition review here. So our atomic number, um, most of you guys hopefully remember that this would be our uh, number of protons. Right, so our atomic number is the number of protons that are found in the nucleus of the subatomic particle. Remember, our mass number is our protons plus our neutrons. Okay, our atomic mass is an approximation of our mass number. It's the average number of isotopes. Okay, Y'all remember isotopes have um, different numbers of neutrons. 
than the original. So an isotope, you may have an element that has um, three protons, three neutrons. Uh, the isotope would have four neutrons. Okay, so we've got a different number of neutrons in isotopes. Radioactive isotopes in particular, okay, these decay spontaneously. And when they decay, they're going to give off particles and energy. Okay? And some of the uses we would have for those would be carbon dating, like for fossils, okay? um, as well as certain medical um, pieces of equipment, medical diagnosis are done using radio, some imaging okay, are done using uh, radioactive isotopes. Okay, so potential energy, as most of you guys are aware, uh, the potential energy is the energy in, um, something has based on its location and structure. You know, a lot of times we think about gravitational pot potential energy, um, you know, how high something is, and so its ability to fall would be um, as it releases energy. One of the things we need to remember is that there's also, uh, very important to us, is what's called electrical potential energy. Okay? And our electrical or electric potential energy, that's going to be based upon separation of charge. Okay? And that's going to be very important to us, especially when we talk about respiration and photosynthesis. Um, we make these concentration gradients of hydrogen ions uh, that are what, gonna, what are really going to power that either production of glucose, production of ATP. Uh, they help with nerve conduction in our body. Okay, so we're going to focus here on um, some ways that electrons can uh, el release this potential energy. Okay, and so, you know, in our atom, we have our um, different levels, right? We have our different um, shells, for lack of a better word, that, of, that our electrons are in when they are orbiting the atomic nucleus. Okay, and so here I've got my first shell, I've got a second one, and I've got a third one here. And so for an electron to move from shell to shell, Okay, it's going to have to absorb energy to go to a higher level, and when it loses energy, it will fall down to a lower level. Okay, and so the electron level that it's at, um, for example, the first or the second or the third, that's its potential energy. And so the farther it gets from the nucleus, so as it gets way out here in this third level, the farther it gets from the nucleus, okay, the more potential energy it will have. Okay, um, you can kind of compare this to stairs. Okay, so if I have a, hold on, bring this to the front. Okay, so if I've got my picture of my stairs here, and this ball is rolling down the stairs, the ball can't stop here. The ball has to stop all the way here. So these are my shells or my levels, each step. Okay, and so the electron has to move fully from one to the other. And as it moves from outer shells towards the inner shells, Okay, it will release some of its energy, and if it was going up the stairs, it would be absorbing energy to be able to move from level to level. And this becomes important to us because the chemical behavior of the atoms, they depend on these electrons. Okay, so how this particular atom here would behave would be dependent upon the electron configuration in, this outermost, in these outer shells. Most of y'all are very most of y'all are very familiar with the concept of valence electrons. Okay? Y'all know that valence electrons are these electrons in the outermost shell here. And so those are the ones that really have the biggest impact on how the um, molecule or the element will behave. Okay? They have the biggest influence on chemical behavior. If these valence shells are completely full, okay, most of you guys are also aware that when they are completely full, that makes the molecule in what we call inert. Okay, or also um, on your periodic table, that would be your noble gases over here on the end. Okay, these ones that don't react because their valence electrons are totally full. So they are, um, they're very stable. So when a molecule has an incomplete valence shell, okay, it's going to be able to either share or transfer those electrons. Like if we <laughs> look here at our sodium, the sodium just has one electron in its valence shell, and hopefully most of y'all are aware that that third level would like to have eight, okay? where chlorine over here only has seven. It's missing one. So neither one of those are completely happy. So they would be able to either share or transfer electrons when, because their valence shell is incomplete. So when, they, when we share or transfer electrons, y'all know we result in um, bonding. Right, we've got two uh, major types of bonds that we're going to talk about, a covalent 
versus an ionic bond. Okay? And so what we see here would be uh, an example of ionic bonding happening. Okay? So I've got this sodium that is, um, could easily give up one electron and this uh, chlorine that would easily accept one electron. So you know an ionic bond is, uh, so we're focused here on ionic bonds, so an ionic bond is going to be, uh, it's going to create ions. It's going to create two charged particles. So with an ionic bond, we have an actual transfer of electrons. And, and so this sodium is going to transfer its electron to the chlorine. And it's going to do that because the chlorine is significantly more electronegative than the sodium is. Again, the chlorine is more electronegative than the sodium. And all electronegativity is, is an atom's attraction for the electrons. Okay? And so it can very easily pull electrons off of sodium. So when I form this ionic bond here, and this sodium electron is transferred over there to the chlorine, my sodium now ends up having a positive charge and it becomes what is called the cation. And my chlorine now has a negative charge because it has more electrons than it does proteins and it is called the anion. And so these two are attracted to one another because you all know positive and negative are attracted to one another. And so they will join together, this positive and this negative charge will bond together to make an ionic compound or a salt. And salt is, um, this happens to refer to table salt right here. But salt is the generic term for our ionic compounds. They're usually crystalline in nature uh, when we find them in nature. So our ionic bonds are electron transfer. We've got these two charged particles, the positive cation, the negative anion, that are attracted to one another. And that's what bonds or holds them together. So if ionic bonds are when uh, electrons are transferred, a covalent bond would be when electrons are shared when there's an incomplete valence shell and we share the electrons. These are stronger bonds than an ionic bond. We can have single covalent bonds, we can have double covalent bonds, and we can have triple covalent bonds. So a single covalent bond would share one pair of electrons, like for instance right here on this hydrogen. A, this would be a single covalent bond. The oxygen here that is sharing two pairs of electrons, that would be a double. Okay? And usually nitrogen is a good example of a triple, can be a good example of a triple covalent bond. Okay? It'll, it can share three pairs of electrons. So covalent bonds are um, sharing of electrons, and we can have um, an equal sharing, which would be a nonpolar covalent bond, or we can have an unequal sharing of electrons, which would be our co polar covalent bond. We talked a little bit about electronegativity before, that the atom, uh, the more electronegative an atom is, the stronger it has attractions for electrons. Okay? And so when you have molecules that are covalently bonded to one another, and one of them is significantly more electronegative than the other, for instance, oxygen compared to hydrogen, we get this polarity, we get this unequal sharing. The electron spends more time around the oxygen because the oxygen is more electronegative. So oxygen essentially, you can think of it as like an electron bully. The electron spends more time hovering around the oxygen than it does around the hydrogen. So it results in this polarity. It makes the oxygen be slightly negative, while the hydrogens are slightly positive. That little sign is a delta. It's a Greek lowercase delta. Okay, and so we've got a slightly negative charge around the oxygen, slightly negative charge around the positives, around the hydrogen, slightly positive charge which is what gives it that polarity. Molecules that share them equally, like for instance here at this hydrogen, they are nonpolar. Okay? So there is no unequal sharing here of the electrons. One, um, one atom is not more electronegative than the other atom. So on that note of polar to versus nonpolar, uh, let's talk a little bit then about intermolecular forces. 
So intermolecular forces, these are going to be between molecules, like between two water molecules. Intramolecular uh, bonding would be the bonds that hold the oxygen and the hydrogen together, where the intermolecular forces would be what hold the various water molecules together. So these are between molecules, not within the molecule, okay, but between them. That is a C. One day I will get good with writing with the stylus. So your intermolecular forces, we've got two big examples we'll talk about are London dispersion forces, London dispersion forces and hydrogen bonds. So London dispersion forces is what we're going to talk about first. And London dispersion forces can happen in all molecules, even if the electronegative difference is zero, even if it is a totally nonpolar molecule like those two hydrogens you saw. The electronegativity difference between those two is zero. So there's no polarity. There's no obvious electron hogging happening here. But we have to think about these electrons that are surrounding this nonpolar molecule. They're constantly moving. They're in constant motion. Okay? And because they're in constant motion, they may not necessarily always be distributed evenly. And when they become distributed unevenly, that results in what we call a dipole. So it's a temporary negative pole that is due to an electron pile up, for lack of a better word, almost like a traffic jam. So these electrons are zipping around on the outside of this nonpolar molecule in the electron cloud, okay, and a bunch of them get caught over here on one side. Okay, and so when they get caught, actually I should have made them get caught on the other side where the picture says they get caught. So when they get caught here on the other side, we get what is called an induced dipole. So we've got this traffic jam of electrons over here, so we get this slightly negative charge on one side and a slightly positive charge on the other side. Okay, and that induced dipole okay, over time can actually become a permanent dipole, which would result in a polar molecule. Remember those polar molecules are attracted to one another because this negative charge would be attracted to the positive charge of another polar, the slight negative charge would be attracted to the slight um, positive charge of another polar molecule. So what this allows for is a stronger attraction between molecules. And the, strong, the, you know, the stronger the attraction is between the various molecules, the harder it would be to break them apart. Okay, for instance, water is, very, water is a polar molecule, and it's hard to break those water molecules apart. Okay, so these interactions, these intermolecular forces, these London dispersion forces, they're not, um, individually they're not super strong, but collectively they can be relatively strong. Uh, we'll talk at near the end of this video about water properties and surface tension okay, and things like that. You guys have seen the bubble that can form on the top of your glass. So collectively these interactions can be very strong. Okay, so that's our London dispersion forces. Okay, they're due to, they can happen in any kind of molecule, even if the electronegativity difference is um, zero. Okay, they're due to that constant electron motion Okay, causing essentially a traffic jam, and so we get this temporary dipole, this temporary um, slightly negative charge on one side, slightly positive charge on the other side, which will then attract molecules to each other. This is more, going to be more common in large molecules, okay, because the larger the molecule, the further away from the nucleus that the electron is, and when the um, electron is far away from the nucleus, Okay, it is easier, it's not held on as tightly, okay, so they move, move around a little bit more and they have a little bit more uh, movement in that electron cloud. So in addition to a London uh, dispersion forces, let's talk about hydrogen bonds also. So these are another type of intermolecular um, force. So these are in between the actual bonds. So if we look here, we've, we're talking between these water molecules, all of these here would be hydrogen bonds. Okay, um, they do involve a hydrogen, but they are due to polarity. So this water molecule, it is, um, it's got the oxygen and the hydrogen, and the oxygen is more electronegative, meaning that the oxygen is going to have a higher affinity for the electrons. So the electrons spend more time around the oxygen. So the oxygen is slightly negative. Okay, which then leaves the hydrogens to be slightly positive. And so if the hydrogens are slightly positive, again, like we know about negative and positive, the positive is attracted to the negative. 
So they form this intermolecular force, this hydrogen bonding. Okay, um, the benefit to the hydrogen bonding okay, is it makes these molecules more attracted to each other. So it takes more energy to separate them. Um, and due to that, that's going to do things like raise the melting point of molecules. It will increase the boiling point of molecules. It will change the heat of vaporization. Think about the amount of heat that needs to be added to water for it to vaporize. Okay. Um, also, it will change solubility by having these intermolecular forces. Okay. And so, and y'all know solubility is the ability to you know, dissolve substances. So for instance, with our solubility, if I have water and I mix it with ammonia, you can see that will form a hydrogen bond. So the um, ammonia is polar, okay, or it has that induced dipole. And so the nitrogen is slightly negative. The hydrogens are slightly positive. The water, okay, its slightly positive end is attracted to the slightly negative end. Okay, that will attract that water to the ammonia, which can help um, separate that ammonia out. So just another instance of how those intermolecular forces come into play. And so London dispersion forces, hydrogen bonds, those are our two uh, main examples of intermolecular forces that will be important to us, especially when we're talking about um, uh, biology, because these hydrogen, um, the hydrogen bonding is extremely important with water. You know, water is our biological medium for all of our organisms. So relating these intermolecular forces to biology, why are those so important? to us, the hydrogen bonding, the London dispersion forces. So in, in biology, the biological molecules are recognized and they interact um, based on shape. Okay? Structure is, ex is crucial for function. Okay? And so the biological molecules, their structure is going to be due to these intermolecular forces. Their 3D shape will be due to these intermolecular forces. And so their shape has a huge impact on their function. If you all remember back to uh, freshman year when we talked about enzymes, we were talking about enzymes denaturing when they lose their shape and so then they can no longer function. So um, let's look at an example of this. Okay? So if we've got um, DNA here, right? you know, you've got your nitrogen base bonding, A to T, C to G. Okay? The reason why you have A to T, A to T and G and C is due to hydrogen bonding. The adenine has two places on it for hydrogen bonding, and so does the thymine. Okay? And guanine and cytosine both have three places for hydrogen bonding. And so that's what limits them to only being able to bond with one another. Okay? Um, another example of structure and function for biological molecules uh, would be endorphins. Okay? Um, some of you have probably heard of endorphins. Okay? And so endorphins are biological molecules, um, in particular uh, hormones usually, okay? and endorphins in our body, this is what they look like. Okay? So they release, um, they relieve pain, they uh, produce a feeling of euphoria, if you guys have ever heard of like a runner's high. Okay? So these endorphins are shaped roughly like this. Okay? Well, your opiates, your things like um, morphine, heroin, they mimic the shape of those endorphins. And so because they mimic the shape of those endorphins, when they are put into your system, they can bind to the same receptor that those endorphins do. So over on the left here, this is your naturally occurring endorphin binding to the receptor. This is morphine binding to the exact same receptor. So it still gives that same feeling that the endorphin did. Okay? It gives that sense of euphoria, that pain relief feeling. Okay? So they have a similar outcome. So again, these intermolecular forces are very important to us because they have a huge impact on these biological molecules because they impact their shape, and their shape really um, determines and dictates what function they're going to have. Okay, so we're going to switch gears over to water. Like I said, that was a very brief chemistry overview. Um, my, my 10th graders, if you guys aren't there yet, come on in and we'll talk some more about this stuff um, if any of it's not making sense to you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about water, because water plays a huge, huge role um, in biology for us, because it is our biological medium for all life. Okay, um, let's take a look at its structure again, just a little bit. 
you know, um, like we've been talking about, it's obviously it's oxygen, hydrogen, and it is a polar molecule. It has those slight positive, slight negative charge. They are polar covalent bonds that are in between those, uh, so those would be intramolecular bonds in between the oxygen and the hydrogen. And then it will form hydrogen bonds, which would be an intermolecular bond between the, the individual water molecules. Okay, water has four basic properties that allow it, that are part of what make it so important to us. Okay, um, and we're going to talk about each one of these individually. So you don't need to worry about pausing it and writing all these down right now or anything. Okay, but we've got cohesion and adhesion. Uh, water's ability to moderate or help regulate temperature. The fact that water will expand when frozen, ice will expand. Okay, and that, that it is a very versatile solvent. So the first property we're going to focus on of water would be um, cohesion and adhesion. Basically, water's ability to stick to stuff. Okay, so with cohesion, it's going to stick to itself. So it can stick to other water molecules. So with cohesion, it's sticking to itself. So with adhesion, then it will essentially stick to other substances. Well, let's think about then for a second what would make that happen. What would make water able to stick to things? Okay, well, that's going to be due to that hydrogen bonding. Okay, um, as we've seen, water can easily stick to itself because of it, it's polar, so it has that slightly negative, slightly positive charge. And so because it is polar and it has that slightly positive, slightly negative charge, it can also stick to other substances. Uh, the example we have here are, is this plant and these trees. Okay, and so where does the plant absorb water? Well, the plant's going to absorb water way down here at the roots. Okay, and so those, that water needs to get all the way up to the tops of the trees. Okay, you all know it goes actually out of the leaves into the atmosphere. And so one of the ways it's going to do that is through, that, um, through the, those hydrogen bonds, through that slightly positive, slightly negative um, charges, and it will be attracted to the walls of the xylem okay, of the plant, and so that will help keep that water from being able to fight gravity because, you know, water's moving up, and so it's having to fight gravity to get up there. So the cohesion, it is sticking to itself, okay? With adhesion, it will stick to other substances, okay? Uh, another example of cohesion and adhesion at work would be surface tension, okay? Most of you guys have seen, you know, when you fill a, fill a glass slightly more than it can hold and you get that kind of bubble along the top, or you've seen the droplets of water added to a penny, or as you can see here with this spider that is quote unquote walking on water. Okay, so this spider here, okay, you can see how it's kind of caving a little bit around its feet, okay, but it's not breaking those hydrogen bonds that hold that water together. So there is enough dispersion of forces here that it's not breaking the hydrogen bonds that hold the water together, and so the spider stays on top of the water. So our second uh, property of water is water's ability to uh, moderate temperature or help regulate temperature. Um, think very. Uh, one of the uh, stations you'll see at your lab is going to ask you. Um, one of the questions will be about why, when you open the oven, why don't your eyeballs burn up? Okay, and that's going to go along with this and water's ability to moderate temperature. Okay, so water has a very high heat capacity. Okay, if y'all remember what heat capacity is, it's the amount of heat to raise one gram of the substance, in this case water. So we're trying to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. And so that takes kind of a lot of heat energy to do that. Okay? And so the result of that is that water is going to absorb large quantities of heat and it's not going to change temperature. You know, if you put a giant pot of water on the stove to boil, okay, it will take a long time for it to boil because that water can absorb so much heat before it starts to really change temperature, which is important especially for us um, in most living organisms, since we have so, we contain so much water, it makes it a very good thermoregulator. Okay? Um, and it's going to do this, it's going to have such a high heat capacity, and it's going to have the ability to absorb so much heat without changing temperature, again, due to these hydrogen bonds. Water, okay, if we, let's bring the picture back up and, and refresh our memory of what water looks like. Water is going to form two hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. Um, for instance, there are two hydrogens, so if we look here, okay, I've got two hydrogens 
on this particular water molecule. So it forms two hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. Okay? So these water molecules are really attracted to one another. And so it takes a lot of energy to break them apart, to turn them into vapor, turn them from liquid form into steam. Okay? And so that goes back to this, you know, that's part of that having a high heat capacity because it has lots of hydrogen bonds. Okay? And the fact that it has all these hydrogen bonds helps it regulate our temperature very well. Okay? It takes heat to break the bonds to raise the temperature. So it would, we would, it would require um, the release of heat when the hydrogen bonds formed. And so we need to think about it in this sense, that it takes energy to break bonds, and it, we release energy okay, when bonds are formed. Okay? So again, it takes energy to release bonds, and it takes energy to break bonds, and we release energy when bonds are formed. There we go. Maybe now I can actually, you can see what I'm talking about here. Okay, so again, it takes energy to break the bonds, and I know this goes against what you, um, kind of what we were taught when we did freshman year, and we talked about ATP, and we break that bond, we release the energy. Okay, just, just kind of bear with me on this one. This will become a lot more, uh, let's say, clear when we do photosynthesis and respiration, about it taking energy to break the bond, but releasing energy when the bond is formed. Okay, um, let's take a temperature example of this, and the ability to moderate... Uh, temperature. So I'm going to have you guys, hopefully, um, not hopefully, you are going to write about this in your notebooks on the left hand side of your notebooks. I'm going to give you some data right now and I'm going to pose a question to you. Okay, so let me find my picture. Here's my climate. Okay, so we think about um, temperature regulation and we're talking about temperature regulation. Think climate. Okay, think a human area. You know, most of you guys are well aware that I grew up in Florida. Okay, and the temperature in Florida does not get into the 100s like it does here in Texas. Okay, the temperature in Florida will stay in the 90s. It does not get to 105 and 110 you know, like it does here in Texas. Okay, however, okay, um, the humidity in Florida is significantly higher than it is here in Texas. The water vapor in the air is much higher in Florida than it is here in Texas. Okay, so that would then say to us, right, that water is such a high heat capacity, there's a lot of water in the air, then there's a lot of, uh, the water can absorb a lot of that heat that is in the air. So the actual temperature would not rise as high. So what we have here is we've got a picture, okay, obviously, we have a picture here of the coast of California, and we've got some various temperatures that are given to you here, a okay, temperature of the ocean, okay, so we've got the temperature of the ocean, versus the temperature of these coastal towns compared to the temperature of these towns that are further inland, okay, that are more in the desert. So I would like y'all to write just a couple of sentences to explain to me why. Okay? Um, you know, if you look at this, Los Angeles is basically lined right on up with Palm Springs, okay? and we're looking at a 30 degree temperature difference between the two of them. Why is that? And I give you a hint, obviously it deals with the amount of water in the air. Just write a couple sentences, you know, practice putting this stuff into your own words. So another example with um, the water's ability to regulate temperature would be with our heat of vaporization. Okay, so we're talking about weather and its ability to regulate climate. Okay, and so what about in organisms okay, or its ability to cool? Okay, so our heat of vaporization, this is going to be the heat absorbed for one gram to be converted to a vapor. So for one gram of water to be converted into a, va a vapor. And as most of y'all know, as, um, as liquid evaporates off of a surface, okay, it cools the surface. Okay? It's, what call, it's what's called evaporative cooling. Okay? Uh, examples of this would be things like uh, sweating, panting. Those are all evaporative cooling. Okay? And what these, those do is they help stabilize the temperature. So as the liquid evaporates off of the surface, Okay, um, it basically takes that heat with it, and so it helps us stabilize temperature. And so again, examples of this in organisms would be sweating okay, and panting. So looking at our third property of water, okay, the third one is that water expands when frozen. Okay, and so when water freezes into ice, 
okay, um, it becomes a little bit more, the hydrogen bonds become more stable. Okay, so you can see here you've got, you get this kind of hexagon shape, okay, and these hydrogen bonds become a little bit more stable. As you can see here, there, it's, there's more movement, okay, and so these hydrogen bonds are constantly breaking and reforming. You notice you don't get those nice hexagons like you do here in ice. And so as the ice becomes frozen, okay, and these hydrogen bonds become more stable, you've got these little pockets essentially of space. And so that's what makes the water, uh, makes water expand as it becomes frozen. If you think about packing people into a room, and you had people standing in the room with their arms up, you'd have a lot of wasted space where people could not fit. So ice expands when frozen, which is not normal per se. You know, there's most of our, um, most of our elements are not, are, and compounds are not going to do that. Okay? Um, but because it expands when it is frozen, okay, ice is actually less dense than water. So ice will float on the top of water. Well, biologically speaking, that is extremely important to organisms that live in environments where uh, they live in you know, ponds or lakes or streams that freeze in the winter time. Okay, so um, if you look here, we've got this little, this little shrimp that's under his layer of ice. Okay, um, and if you um, know anything about how a pond or a lake or a stream would freeze, they essentially freeze from the top down. Okay, so the entire body of water does not become full of ice. Okay, the ice stays on the top here because the ice is less dense. Okay, so the ice essentially floats to the top okay, and it will um, trap the water underneath it. And so the organisms can still live throughout the winter time underneath the ice because there's still liquid there underneath the ice. Okay, and our fourth and final property of water is that it is very versatile solvent. Um, if y'all remember, or hopefully you remember, okay, what a solution is. Okay, you know, a solution is a homogeneous uh, liquid mixture, okay, and the difference between a solvent versus the solute. Okay, so the solvent is the one that does the dissolving. Um, in this instance here, I've got um, salt and water. So my solvent is my water. My solute is my salt that's getting dissolved. So my solvent is the one that does the dissolving. My solute is the one that gets dissolved. Okay. This is also what is called an aqueous solution. And so an aqueous solution is going to have um, water as the solvent. I typed so L on purpose. Okay. So an aqueous solution would have water as the solvent. And water is such a good solvent because it is, again, because it is polar, and so it forms hydrogen bonds easily. And so when you put an ionic compound, uh, in this instance we've got the table salt in here, so I've got an ionic compound into the water, it'll form these hydration shells around the water. Or the water will form the hydration cells around the ionic compound. So these here would all be examples of hydration shells. Okay? And so they're going to form these, again, due to the hydrogen bonds. Okay. You can also have um, non-ionic um, polar molecules, okay. non-ionic polar molecules, for instance, uh, proteins, okay. uh, large proteins. They can be dissolved as well in water because they'll have areas on them that will be ionic or will be polar. For instance, our purple here is our protein, okay. and you can see it's got areas on it okay, that have a little bit of a charge. And so because they have a little bit of a charge, they're attracted to the water. Um, really the only thing that water is not going to dissolve well is going to be hydrophobic or nonpolar molecules. Okay, so your hydrophobic versus hydrophilic. Um, let's go to the next slide for this. Okay, so that last slide was going to get really messy. So hydrophilic versus hydrophobic molecules. So our hydrophobic molecules, and these are water-fearing, and these are hydrophilic or water-loving. So hydrophilic molecules, these would be ionic molecules, they would be polar molecules, things that water is attracted to because they have a charge. Hydrophobic molecules would be nonpolar molecules, things that are not attracted to water. Um, examples here would be uh, like lipids, you know, your oils, fats, waxes. Those are not attracted to water because they're nonpolar. They don't have a charge. And so water is not a very good solvent for those. Um, an example when those mix with water would be what's called a colloid. Okay? So a colloid 
is a stable suspension of fine particles. So we got fine particles, but they're not, it's not a homogeneous um, mixture, like a solution. Okay? It's a suspension, like these particles will settle out eventually. Okay? So a stable suspension of fine particles in the liquid. Um, a very common example would be milk. Okay? Milk is a bunch of fat okay? mixed in with, basically mixed in with water, mixed in with liquid. Okay, so those are the, those um, hydrophobic molecules or nonpolar molecules. They would not be good um, candidates for wa water to be a solvent for. Okay, so our next slide, we're, next uh, time we're going to talk a little bit about acids and buffers, and we're going to move on to macromolecules. So I will see you guys uh, next class, and we will do a little lab about water.